always a pleasure to have you on board. We are talking about agriculture and food security. And one of the things we are talking about is about dairy farming. And P.S., one of the things I would want you to talk about is um, the measures that were enacted by the Livestock Bill 2023. How has it impacted uh, dairy farming so far? Uh, the Livestock Bill uh, 2023 what that does, it just really modernized the way we look at our livestock sector. Uh -huh. uh, our livestock sector traditionally has not been commercialized. It's been seen as something more of a pastoralist thing and a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. And no serious government investment previously, previous governments have been made in the livestock sector. Mm -hmm. uh, with this era of ours, with our economic transformation agenda, right from the bottom up, Livestock is one of those areas that was uh, seen as a priority area. So in the top priority value chains out of the nine of them, uh, dairy and leather comes very strongly from the livestock sector. Mm -hmm. And for us to be able to do that, we needed to regulate a few things yeah. within uh, the livestock sector. Yes. And some of the gains the livestock bill has done are mm -hmm. uh, threefold. Uh, number one, we are regulating the area of livestock feed and feeds and also the area of livestock professionals so that we can make sure that the people who are going out there as extension workers serving our livestock farmers are known, are registered and are competent so that they can advise our livestock farmers to produce exactly what is needed mm -hmm. by the market. Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, we'll be regulating uh, livestock paraprofessionals, professionals and paraprofessionals, those who deal with feed, those who deal with artificial insemination, which is genetics, uh, even those who deal with uh, animal health and animal husbandry, mm -hmm. so that we can register them, we can ensure that they are trained and they have the knowledge to advise our livestock farmers on the best way to produce quality livestock for the market. Mm -hmm. And that again, of course, puts money in the pockets of our farmers. Mm -hmm. The second thing the Livestock Bill does is it in anchors in law our training institutions. We have about uh, eight training institutions. There's the Meat Training Institute, the Dairy Training Institute, uh, the Livestock Training Institute, many of them. We have the AHITIS, which is the Animal Health uh, and Industry Training Institutions, which ensure that the professionals we are training in this market can go out and work out in the industry mm -hmm. uh, and they've previously not been anchored properly in in law so the livestock bill does that the second the third thing that is of significance of the livestock bill does is that it creates what we are calling a livestock marketing council uh, it will be a council that will be primarily private sector led that helps with the market dynamics around livestock value chains there's about 11 livestock value chains. Mm -hmm. uh, I know we keep talking about three in terms of the priority value chains, which is the dairy, the meat value chain, and the leather value chain. But you know, we have apiculture, honey, we have the pigs, we have the rabbits, we have the donkeys, mm -hmm. uh, we have the poultry, and we have several other value chains within uh, the livestock sector. And uh, what this does is it ensures that we are able to do aggregation properly, mm -hmm. we are able to do value addition on our projects, pro uh, products properly, and we're able to find that linkage to market so that we can really commercialize our livestock sector mm -hmm. and ensure that we create a brand, just like in tea, we've created a tea brand, we want to create a livestock brand yeah. uh, for, for our livestock products mm -hmm. around the world so that people around the world can really know that Kenya uh, has good meat and Kenya has good honey and mm -hmm. Kenya has good milk and it just makes our products very competitively globally. Yes. So the Livestock Marketing Council will be integral in that in just making sure that it brings all the stakeholders together and we begin marketing our livestock products as a team of all stakeholders instead of uh, incoherently and individually. Mm -hmm. So that's what the Livestock uh, Bill does. For the dairy industry, Mike, to answer your question, mm -hmm. Uh, dairy has been governed by the Dairy uh, Act, 1959. So uh, a lot of reform needs to be done yeah. with, with the same because we've been go governed by a very outdated act. Mm -hmm. So we are now in the process of putting together a dairy bill. Mm -hmm. 
it has gone through public participation. Yes. The bill is industry-led, so it's led by the stakeholders in the private sector, yeah. primarily on what they'd like to see the dairy industry look like. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are now just waiting to do a national validation mm -hmm. to validate all we found during public participation, yeah. after which we will send this bill to cabinet and onward to parliament for passing. Mm -hmm. uh, a main part of this dairy bill will introduce what we are calling quality-based payments, like I spoke about a little earlier, where we will be paying the farmer uh, based on the quality of milk they provide uh -huh. and that gives our farmers intensives of just upping their game uh -huh. and producing quality milk yes. uh, it will also regulate uh, our dairy products uh -huh. to ensure that our milk is safe uh, has very low uh, bacteria uh -huh. so that we can uh, get rid of antimicrobial resistance and also has uh, almost no or no aflatoxin which uh -huh. has been an issue with our milk so as we are running uh, safer milk campaigns and ensuring that uh, our Kenya dairy board is on the ground making sure that our milk is safe, we also want to anchor it in law and give the Kenya dairy board you know, a little more powers to be able to regulate the milk industry. Mm -hmm. And that's the highlight really of our dairy bill. So yes. a lot of reforms going on in the, in the dairy sector. Yes. And as PS, I'm quite happy because we are beginning to see the results yes. on uh, the economic activity dairy is creating yes. right at the ground to yes. uh, our bottom-up farmers. What about the impact of the um, livestock insurance? What's the objective and how are farmers uh, taking it? Uh, uh, livestock insurance is an intervention uh, to mitigate the effects of drought. Mm -hmm. Mike, you know, just two seasons ago, we went through the uh, worst drought in almost 40 years. Yeah. And in that drought, we lost approximately 2.5 million herds of cattle, yeah. uh, worth almost 500 billion shillings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big hit to our economy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm aware of families, especially up north in our arid areas, whose entire livelihood was lost. Uh, they use their, their livestock mm -hmm. as their wealth yeah. and they lost all their livestock and those families now can have moved from being very stable families to families that cannot feed themselves, mm -hmm. families that cannot pay school fees for their children mm -hmm. and the situation is very, very dire. Yeah. So livestock insurance is an intervention in which we are creating resilience uh, to drought. So we're encouraging our farmers, listen, why don't you register for livestock insurance? Mm -hmm. We will put you into a system so that we can ensure that you're inside the financial inclusion of our country. Mm -hmm. uh, that gives you now access to credit for inputs such as medicine, mm -hmm. uh, inputs such as food in the, in the event of a drought. Mm -hmm. uh, and the livestock insurance is really not to ensure the farmer for towards the death of an animal it's to keep the animal alive and for them to do that that's why we're saying we need now to bring them into our financial system so we are, we are, we are enticing our farmers when they buy insurance we make sure they open an account we give them some savings bonus into that account to ensure that once the drought hits the farmer or the livestock keeper can go somewhere has a history of banking in a financial system and can now be able to get a facility to buy food, uh, to buy medicine, and to take care of their animals that will see that animal live throughout the drought. Mm -hmm. uh, so far, we had targeted uh, by year two, which is where we are now, mm -hmm. uh, to have uh, by June registered 50,000 uh, farmers on on livestock insurance, yes. uh, 25,000 per year. Uh, we have surpassed that target by almost three. We've now registered almost 140,000 wow. against our target of 50,000. So it's something that's being taken very positively. Mm -hmm. And just two weeks ago, I was out in my home county, Kitui, launching the same. And I've seen the response even in Kitui mm -hmm. for livestock insurance is, is quite overwhelming. So it's a product that uh, the farmers are really finding helpful. It's uh, rolled out in all the 47 counties? It's rolled out in the 21 arid and semi-arid counties. Mm -hmm. So it really just focuses on the counties mm -hmm. that have um, are prone to extreme 
drought mm -hmm. uh, during the dry season. What about uh, farmers in other counties who are also into livestock uh, farming and husbandry? Well, they can be able to register uh, commercially for livestock insurance because yeah. we have local insurance company, countries that do that. But this is a government subsidy mm -hmm. where we are actually subsidizing the insurance for the first year mm -hmm. uh, for 80%. And then second year, 60%. It's a five-year program so that by the end of the five years, yes. our farmers are empowered enough yeah. uh, and have now created a sustainable model mm -hmm. through which they can now offtake yes. uh, their animals during the drought season because they are alive and they are not dead. Mm -hmm. And by year five, now the farmers should be able to do this on their own mm -hmm. without any government support. Yes. So that's uh, let's, let's look at the tea subsector. Yes. Well, uh, it also contributes to around 2% to the GDP and 21% 20, to the total export earnings. How has the reforms within this sector impacted the small-scale farm <coughs> so far? Excuse me. Um, our intervention on uh, uh, focusing on the tea industry as, as one of our top exports mm -hmm. in this country uh, especially again the fertilizer program yeah. which uh, the subsidy fertilizer program that has been extremely successive mm -hmm. uh, uh, successful mm -hmm. we've seen now almost uh, eight point something million uh, farmers gain from fertilizer mm -hmm. uh, just this season of the long rains about almost uh, four million farmers have been able to get the subsidized fertilizer of which we saw tremendous tremendous impact in uh, last year mm -hmm. on the same uh, you know mike you've seen the price of unga has almost come down by half it's because of that sub fertilizer subsidy mm -hmm. that was able to really increase productivity mm -hmm. and the tea sector was not left behind with that productivity mm -hmm. we were able to actually uh, 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 increase our production for tea significantly mm -hmm. uh, from about 138 metric tons to about 180 mm -hmm. uh, no 138 billion shillings to 180 billion shillings worth of tea export uh, in the last year so tea has quite has quite grown mm -hmm. uh, the farmer was actually not left behind yeah. because uh, the farmer also increased their tea earnings mm -hmm. from you know, around 52 shillings uh, that they are earning to about 59 shillings yeah. per, per kilogram. Mm -hmm. So the farmer also really benefited from um, this program on, on tea. So from where I sit, uh, the tea is doing quite well. But also farmers complain on late payments and also some are saying they are yet to experience um, the, the, the effects of prices. What uh, what do you say about that? Low payments and late uh, disbursement of, uh, of, of, uh, of the payout. And also, it applies also in, in, in the coffee sector. Yeah. The same applies in the coffee sector. Well, the government interventions have just ensured that we have higher productivity. Mm -hmm. And because of creating that market for the product, our farmers get a higher price. Uh, but the sector is also governed through other structures such as cooperatives and you will find uh, different cooperatives have uh, different government governance structures mm -hmm. uh, for example cooperative a might charge a higher administrative fee than cooperative b so there are some cooperatives uh, that might pay on a monthly basis others might pay on a three-month basis others might pay a bonus others might not pay a bonus mm -hmm. so it's the governance structures of the cooperatives that will determine mm -hmm. how the tea farmer uh, benefits yes. uh, from, from from this uh, I'm aware that the Ministry of Cooperatives is also very focused in regulating the governance of cooperatives to ensure mm -hmm. that our farmers are not exploited mm -hmm. by the cooperatives, are not exploited by the management of the cooperatives, that uh, the cooperatives don't take all the benefit of uh, the good market government has found, mm -hmm. of the good yield government has been able to enable mm -hmm. uh, to the detriment of the farmer. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the farmer who's producing mm -hmm. actually gets the benefit mm -hmm. and not somebody else down the value chain. Mm -hmm. So I'm aware of those reforms within the cooperative sector and uh, I am sure sooner than later 
uh, our cooperatives will be well governed to the benefit of our farmers. There's a, the, the front page of the Daily Nation today is talking about how tea farmers have lost 600 million. What's your reaction to that? Yes, I saw, I saw that headline actually when yes. I was on my way <laughs> here this morning. Uh, but if you read, that's what the headline says. Uh -huh. And the headline has been designed to make it look like they have lost through their production. Mm -hmm. But if you go into the story, you'll find out the alleged losses mm -hmm. are not because of production issues, are mm -hmm. not because of pricing issues, mm -hmm. are because of mismanagement of the farmer's money mm -hmm. by their cooperatives, which mm -hmm. is just what I mentioned right now. Yes. So I think just stronger governance within the cooperatives and stronger regulation by government, mm -hmm. uh, which could be done through legislation, mm -hmm. uh, would solve that problem yeah. to make sure that farmers don't make all this money mm -hmm. and then the money is embezzled by their cooperatives, uh, then that uh, makes uh, the farmer become the loser while they've done the hard work of producing. Yes. Yeah. The aspect of um, access to financing and uh, agriculture, uh, to financing agriculture and access to credit for small scale farmers. Uh, it's important. How is it being utilized? Are farmers utilizing this or is it available? Yes, absolutely. You know, the flagship of this government was the Hustler Fund. Uh -huh. And the Hustler Fund has been extremely successful. Uh, there's tens of billions of shillings that have been circulating around the Hustler Fund. Mm -hmm. And as uh, financial inclusion was being separated last, uh, I think it was a uh, Jamuhuri Day, mm -hmm. it was announced that uh, the Hustler Fund now will also be available to groups uh, from 50,000 to almost a million shillings. Mm -hmm. And that has also been extremely successful. Mm -hmm. So we can have our farmers come together mm -hmm. as groups or cooperatives mm -hmm. and use the Hustler Fund mm -hmm. to ensure that they can have very, very concessional lending mm -hmm. to be able to increase their productivity, pay for their inputs, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. We also have the Agricultural Finance Corporation, which is in our Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development, mm -hmm. in which uh, the President pronounced himself yeah. that he was going to uh, ensure that we get budgetary provision mm -hmm. for onward lending to our farm farmer, mm -hmm. uh, increase fivefold from 2 billion shillings to 10 billion shillings. Mm -hmm. Again, that is a big game changer in just ensuring that our farmers get access to financing so that they can produce more. Uh, and producing more, Mike, just doesn't mean producing more, but we also want them to produce efficiently so that, you know, from the same piece of land, they can get higher yield, uh, which means they get more product from the same piece of land using the same amount of inputs, same amount of fertilizer, same amount of pesticides, same amount of water. But if we mechanize our agriculture and make mm -hmm. it more efficient, and we do what we are calling smart agriculture, mm -hmm. then where you are able to produce uh, two tons per acre, you can produce eight tons per acre. And for a farmer to get there, we just need to be able to support them with uh, some financing mm -hmm. to buy those uh, mechanization equipment, which mm -hmm. is another big agenda mm -hmm. for, 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 this, for this government. Uh, you will see how we were able to tackle post-harvest issues with maize mm -hmm. when we got such a high yield of maize because of the subsidy fertilizer program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it was our highest yield in almost 10 years or more than 10 years. And now we are faced with a secondary program of post-harvest losses. Where are we going to store this maize? And the government quickly intervened and went and bought 100 uh, mobile maize dryers mm -hmm. to go out to the farms, mm -hmm. harvest this maize, and dry them automatically so that we don't suffer post-harvest losses. Yes. It was a large success. So mechanization and using technology in our agriculture sector mm -hmm. has uh, been a big agenda of this government. And again, like I said, since it's been deliberate, since it's been part of our plan, uh -huh. since it's been implemented to the T, uh -huh. then we are beginning to see the results of this very deliberate action. Yes. Uh, let's talk about the coffee subsector. Yes. It's also very important to the person, especially uh, in coffee growing areas. And uh, some of the reforms including include the aspect where county governments are licensing uh, uh, millers, capital markets, authority, brokerage farms, and also agricultural food security licensing uh, coffee buyers. 
But what about private millers and what is the role of the new Kenya uh, planters cooperative? Uh, there's a lot of reforms that are going on also in the coffee sector. <laughs> um, the deputy president has been spearheading this. Yes. You recall there was a coffee conference that was uh, held, uh, I believe it might have been uh, in Meru. Yeah. Um, the, that there was a coffee conference where all the stakeholders from the coffee sector uh -huh. were brought together under uh -huh. the leadership of the deputy president uh -huh. and our minister for agriculture. And with that, uh, we listened. Uh, listened to what the farmers were saying, listened to what the processors were saying, listened to what the cooperatives were saying, listened to what the market was saying. And you recall, uh, because of some cartels that were in the coffee sector, um, coffee uh, auction was actually halted until the mess was sorted out, uh, until you could get direct access mm -hmm. into the exchange, the coffee exchange, yeah. until we could ensure that a bulk of the money that is uh, being generated from coffee, and Kenya produces some of the best coffee in the world, yeah. goes to the farmer and yeah. doesn't uh, end up in the pockets of some other people, middlemen along the chain, yes. who didn't work so hard to produce that kind of coffee. And uh, a lot of those reforms were done. The exchange was open, and you saw now the farmers are selling their coffee at significantly higher prices. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of these interventions where we sit down and we listen to the industry mm -hmm. and take into consideration uh, their input really helps government create that environment for the entire sector to thrive. Yes. So coffee is also one of those sectors that's thriving. I am aware there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. Yes. I mentioned here earlier that just last week, uh, you know, my minister was out in China mm -hmm looking for markets for tea and coffee and all of that. Yeah. Um, the president has, uh, as you've seen, he's been our chief salesman as a country, mm -hmm. where every time he goes out of the country, he's able to come back with trade agreements that really uh, focus on enhancing our economic transformation agenda. Yes. Uh, and it's really put Kenya in the map uh, for, for, for as a market for some of this this product. So some of the coffee farmers are yet to receive their payments, so it begs the questions, are there bottlenecks? And if they are there, how are they going to be streamlined yeah. in this case? Like I mentioned earlier, again, it's governed through cooperatives, and some of the cooperatives have different governance structures. So in some of those areas where the farmers feel that they are not being treated properly or they are not getting their dues on right, uh, at the right time. Mm -hmm. That usually is escalated to the Ministry of Cooperatives mm -hmm. uh, through uh, the Cooperative State Department. Mm -hmm. And then we come in as government to mm -hmm. ensure that uh, our farmers are treated properly yes. and get what is due to them. Yes. So I think if that is happening, there are probably some isolated cases yes. that the ministry is probably working on. Yes. You mentioned something to do with um, subsidized uh, fertilizer. And um, we live in a country where agriculture is not just a means of looking for money. It's a livelihood for, for millions. And uh, can you say from where you stand, the subsidized fertilizer uh, initiative is a success? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the success are in the numbers. The numbers don't lie. I mean, we grew from negative growth of 2.3% to almost 7.9% in agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, which necessitated us to grow economically to almost 5.9%. Mm -hmm. uh, those are numbers that are showing something is happening. Mm -hmm. And we can attribute that, attribute that to not just the fertilizer program, but many other interventions that we've been able to, uh, to make. Uh, for example, the farmer registration that has been very, very successful. Yeah, has enabled us to make clear decisions, really know where is the farmer, what are they planting, what are their issues, what is their capacity, so that government now can make focused interventions to enable that farmer. Mm -hmm. And this is what is uh, driving our productivity. Uh -huh. um, cabinet approved also another very, very progressive initiative mm -hmm. that will add a lot of value uh -huh to our agricultural sector, uh -huh. and this is what we are calling the Land Commercialization Initiative, uh -huh. 
where we are offering large tracts mm -hmm. of government land owned by regional development authorities, owned by the State Department of Livestock, owned by the Kenya prisons, that is unproductive, yes. that is sitting out there as a silent and used asset. Yeah. And we are opening up that land to, uh, uh, to private sector and partnering with them where we avail them that land to be able to produce. So we've seen a lot of success with that program, especially in the Tana Delta area, where there's rice production that's going on, there's maize production that's going on. And we are proving that in the ASAL areas, which is almost 85% of this country, that we can actually put it under product, uh, agricultural productivity. Uh, I am aware that uh, there's a lot of irrigation initiatives that are, that are happening because you know, only 15% of our country uh, gets you know, adequate rainfall and all of that, and that's the bread basket. But mm -hmm. we have these other 85% mm -hmm. that, if properly irrigated, can also produce agriculture. I mean, we saw a lot of success where there's almost 2,000 acres of maize that has been produced now in Wajia, mm -hmm. which uh, really has never been uh, known for food production. Yes. But now we are seeing that because of the interventions that government is making mm -hmm. to ensure that we're able to irrigate and teach our farmers uh, the importance of, of irrigation. Yes. Uh, through the government's initiative of having dams, both the large-scale dams, the medium-scale dams, and the smaller dams around the entire country, and having the dams being, made by the, being uh, developed by the private sector is uh, the game-changer in our irrigation agenda. Yes. So the big dam that has just been completed out there in Tana River has changed that entire area and soon you're going to have millions of acres in Tana River which is considered an arid area now producing food. Uh -huh. uh, I am aware in Isiolo and I was uh, in consultation with the PS for irrigation, yes. uh, PS Kimodo just the other day, yes. that now to take care of irrigation in that area, especially for uh, production of animal feed around mm -hmm. the Isiolo area, uh -huh. which will now give food to about 16 counties to produce livestock uh -huh. uh, in that area, with another very big dam uh -huh. that a uh, contractor has already been awarded and is in the beginning uh, stages to go and uh, uh, develop a dam yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And that again is going to open up that entire area around yes. Samburu and Masabit and Meru and Laikipia and Isiolo. And all those livestock keepers now all of a sudden will have a lot of water where we can put a feedlot, uh, grow a lot of pasture and fodder for our animals, mm -hmm. which will then fatten them and uh, give the market, both local and global, mm -hmm. the kind of quality animals that they need in the quantities that uh, they also need. So yes. a lot of work is going on into, into this. And yes. in all of that, fertilizer has played a very, very integral role. Yeah, it has it's played. extremely successful. Yeah, but also uh, we witnessed cases where farmers were given fake fertilizer. But now, what are the measures that have been put owing to that case to ensure it never repeats again and farmers are not duped into get, uh, getting fake fertilizers? Uh, the substandard fertilizer that was found in the market was uh, very unfortunate, but it was also very negligible. Uh, you've seen the figures that I have been able to mention here. Just this season of the long range, yeah. about 3.9 million bags of fertilizer have already been dispensed. Mm -hmm. uh, almost 8 million have already were dispensed in the last uh, season combined with this season. Mm -hmm. uh, that fertilizer has worked because we've seen the productivity for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So there was a small isolation that was caught quickly and the distribution was stopped because we caught it very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was really blown out of, out of pro pro proportion. Um, unfortunate that it happened. But what's important is that we put in measures to ensure that it doesn't happen Again, mm -hmm. so just tighter controls around uh, the National Cereal and, and, and Produce uh, Board to ensure that all the fertilizer that comes into their stores mm -hmm. for onward distribution to the farmers, yes. uh, quality control is uh, adhered to a little more stricter. Yes. Uh, we ensure that we, um, of course, adhere to the CAB standards, who are the institution that is really um, mandated to ensure that 
all the goods we consume mm -hmm. and products mm -hmm. are of acceptable standard. Yes. And uh, we shouldn't see that that recur. Again, like I said, it was recurrent. It didn't happen in the last mm -hmm. uh, season. Yeah. It happened on a very small scale, negligible in this season. And I'm sure measures have been put into place where it won't happen in the future. All right. Uh, we are talking to Honorable Jonathan Mweke, who is the Principal Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture. We are talking about food security and agriculture, which is the theme for this year's Madrakade. Don't go too far. We continue with this conversation after this short break. <laughs>